So good morning, everyone. My name is Miri Barak. Um, I'm going to share with you some of our experience at the Technion when we have uh, developed uh, a MOOC, a massive open online course in nanotechnology and nanosensors. The course is actually um, the course that Hussam Hayek uh, is, was and is giving until uh, now. Uh, so let's start. I'm going to talk, um, my talk is going to be divided to four sections. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of uh, MOOCs and the state of affairs uh, um, up till 2017. I think it's important in order to um, tell you what is the context of the, our initiative and also the research that I'm conducting. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, our MOOC, and actually it was the first bi bilingual MOOC that uh, was focused on nanosensors. There was another MOOC at that time in, uh, about uh, nanotechnology. It was introduction to nanotechnology, but ours is focusing on nanosensors. And then I'm going to um, talk a little bit, if time permits, uh, about the research. I'm a, a sociocultural a, a researcher. I come from the educational realm, so uh, this is a, the, the interactions between people, how people work in groups. This is something that is very interesting uh, to me, especially when people come from different cultures and different uh, na nations. And then um, I'm going to uh, relate to a question that many people ask me, uh, is, are MOOCs disruptive innovation? Are MOOCs a game changer in um, a higher education? And feel free, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how formal or un informal, I'm, a, I'm usually an, a very a person people, so if you have questions, you know, just stop, I'll, I'll answer, and we'll go on um, as, as I see what interests you and uh, what um, maybe we move forward. So uh, the first thing that I ask is how many people know what MOOCs are? If you can just raise your hand. So this is amazing. When I asked this question, I think four years ago or Six, uh, five years ago, when we started uh, in 2013, only few have raised their hands, so most of the people already know what MOOCs are. How many have you have uh, have completed a full MOOC? Not so much. Yeah, I, I also register to many MOOCs, but I uh, tend not to complete them. So we are going to see also statistics: how many completed our uh, nanotechnology and nanosensors MOOC, which is interesting. Uh, so uh, MOOCs, are, uh, MOOCs are actually the acronym of a, a massive open online courses and I go back to the origins because um, I don't know how many uh, of you are from the United States, are there people or only from Europe, okay, and Canada, people from Canada. Okay, so usually the, the uh, people from Stanford um, take the credit for it, but uh, it's actually the uh, in invention or the idea of people from Canada, which had really a social um, a mindset and they really wanted to share their knowledge with the world without thinking, at least not at the beginning, about profit. So um, the credit goes to George Simmons and Stephen Downs, which are Canadian uh, professors who taught a course in Manitoba uh, on uh, connectivism. Their theory, they invented a theory about the, the connectivism, which didn't raise, you know, uh, educational-wise, uh, we, we only few use these, uh, this uh, theory, but uh, they have um, uh, started something new because they said, why teach only 25 or 30 30 students coming to my to our classroom. If we talk about connectivism, let's open our classroom to the whole world. Let's practice what we preach. Uh, so um, they have done that. Uh, they opened the course. Everyone, it's not only the syllabus, come see our syllabus or come read our articles. It's actually participating in the course, taking part in the discussions, online discussions. And they use very simple tools that were, uh, at that time, I'm talking about 2008, uh, that they were available at that time. And they were amazed to see that once they, um, without a lot of marketing, they the course started to be very popular and uh, more than 2,000 people uh, um, around uh, there, you know, in North America enrolled to their course. 
Uh, so then came David Cormier, who said, well, this is a new trend, let's call it a MOOC. So David Cormier was the first one who um, actually coined the term. But then when um, people from the United States, people from Stanford saw that um, this is something huge, something that can be um, translated maybe even to money, because if one student pays only one dollar, see how many money we can uh, make, and then people uh, from uh, the United States took it one level uh, ahead and built, uh, invested a lot of money in building platforms such as Udacity um, and uh, uh, then um, uh, Coursera and now uh, edX of MIT and Harvard. So this is something that really spread out uh, the, uh, during the whole world. And this is a, 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 a grant a hype cycle, which is the cycle of adapting new technologies. And this was, uh, a, 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 I think it was published two years ago. And people said, well, MOOCs are something, some new trend. They're going to be some hype around 2012, 2013, but then it will drop. And uh, the reality is not uh, uh, so. Uh, I'll show you in a minute a graph what happens now, but these are the three main um, uh, platforms, Udacity, Coursera, and edX. And now we have many more. Canvas is beginning to be um, a, a big participator, and also the British Future Learn, the British um, a, platform for the, in the UK Open University and many other um, institutions. So um, you can see from this graph that it goes, it, it increases. The number of courses increases, the number of universities that are participating increases, and uh, we started with a few, only few elite universities, but now it grows to many colleges that participate also, uh, allow students to use MOOC uh, courses and give creditation and also uh, design and uh, deliver their own courses. The Technion started into, um, actually the Technion launched the uh, nanotechnology and nanosensor course in 2014, but we, uh, we started to work uh, on the course in 2013. Um, Okay, so these are the, the, the Chinese platform now is um, very popular in China, of course. Um, and this is um, the division of um, a, a how popular different courses are from different disciplines. And we can see that the most popular are um, technology, like nanosensors. Uh, there is also um, a business. Okay, so this is the division of topics. I, I showed this uh, pie because um, it's interesting. When we started, the only, um, a, the only language that was popular in these platforms was English. Actually, the nanosensor uh, and nano, uh, nanotechnology and nanosensor course that Hussam uh, developed was the first one who, who was bi that was bilingual. We a, a, a produced the whole course in English, and then the same thing, we took the same slides but translated it in, into Arabic, and then Hussam talked the same um, ideas, presented the same ideas uh, in Arabic. And the translation, it was a huge uh, project because Arabic has different dialects. I don't know how many of you uh, know and go into these details, but it took us, I think, a half a year to um, just the translation and asking people. And, and Hussam is an Arab-speaking person, so we thought it would be no problem, but uh, we found out that um, a, we had to invent words in Arabic because it wasn't um, a, a advanced enough for the new technology and uh, new materials that Hussam uh, showed. So this was a challenge. But now when we talk about um, uh, MOOCs, we can see that there are uh, MOOCs in different uh, languages. English is, of course, the dominant language, but we have in Spain, Spanish and, and, and French and Chinese, Arabic. And I always show um, that, I don't know how, but 
Hebrew is one of the, if I think, 12 or 15 uh, languages, and it's funny because how many people speak Hebrew? And you know, in order to, co to call a course a MOOC, a massive open online course with hundreds of thousands of participants, I don't know how many actually speak Hebrew enough to uh, visit the courses, but of course, we are there. Okay, so this is the course. Um, if you, uh, the course uh, was uploaded to the Coursera uh, platform. The Coursera platform uh, was um, developed by Stanford, uh, uh, which also has an Israeli connection because um, uh, Daphne Kohler, who uh, uh, together with Edward, Edward Neg uh, actually built a uh, Coursera. She's an Israeli, a former Israeli, uh, uh, and she, started, uh, she studied in the Hebrew University and then moved to Stanford. And she used to be a professor there, but now she moved into business. And um, so at that time, in 2012, 2013, that was the most robust um, platform now and, and the other platforms were only starting, so we decided to go with Coursera. Uh, we were quite um, a, a happy about it. Uh, the platform did give us uh, solutions to what we wanted. I come from the educational part, although my background is in uh, biotechnology and food engineering. I also worked in the industry, but I moved to something more challenging, which is education. And then um, um, we had some, uh, we e even, we're able to ask Coursera at that time uh, to make some changes to have some more collaboration tools uh, that students can actually work together and not each one alone in their house, wherever they are in the world. So these are the two courses. They were uploaded, delivered, launched the same time. And it was designed, a, a purposefully designed in a way that it would be launched exactly when the semester starts at the Technion. So Chustam delivers this course every a year in um, our spring semester, we call it spring from March uh, to June, July, uh, and we started it together with the Technion students. So the Technion students were facing the first time, the first time at the Technion, the first ever, uh, students were able to um, uh, enroll to a course which was uh, totally online and work with students from other places in the world, and actually people from other places in the world. You can, sh uh, I'll show you the demographics. It was people from 17 to 70. So this was a very um, a interesting uh, experience for our student. And uh, our students were enrolled to the English course. Okay, although some of the students speak Arabic, but we asked them all to enroll to the English course. Uh, but at the same time, we had the Arabic course. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm showing this um, uh, slide because building a MOOC, an international MOOC, and I, uh, either it's in nanotechnology or other courses, and you really want people to connect with each other, the people who build the course have to come from different perspectives and from different backgrounds. So we had really an interdisciplinary uh, group of uh, a team that built the course, and we had, um, we, we invested a lot of efforts. Hussam um, sometimes in the middle of the night uh, used to draw molecules because we wanted to show something um, a more, a, a more abstract. So he said, okay, I'm going to draw these molecules and then I'm going to send you the slides. Um, Meital, sorry. Meital uh, uh, was his PhD student. She, she has graduated and now she started a startup of her own. Uh, 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 Nisrin is still working with Hossam. She also graduated, but she's working still uh, on projects that he's uh, doing, and uh, Muhammad. Uh, so Meital is uh, Jewish. Uh, Nisrin Muhammad are Muslims. Um, uh, Hussam is, uh, is Christian. From our part, from the education part, um, uh, Abil wa is uh, Muslim. She also graduated, and Maya is now graduating. Uh, Maya is Jewish, and I'm Jewish. So it was a very diverse, uh, gender-wise and cultural-wise, and it was so great the experience of having 
the ability to work together and create something new uh, and bringing um, this to the world. And I show this because you know, people from here are from Israel or they're very um, supportive because the fact that you're here, it's, it's, you know, it's, it shows something. But uh, when I show this to the world, people are, are amazed because in the news they see or, or they hear only about conflicts. And there's a lot of good work done, especially in the academia, with multicultural and people working uh, in multicultural, uh, multi-religion um, uh, uh, teams. So the project was so special that um, uh, Thomas C. Friedman from the New York Times actually um, uh, came to Israel. He landed, he met Hussam in the airport and then m m moved back to New York uh, to continue with his work. Um, so Hussam had to drive all the way to uh, the airport, meeting him there. And um, this was an article that was uh, published in 2014 when we launched the, uh, the course. And I'll just uh, read a little bit. Beginning March 2, Professor Hussam Hayek will teach the first ever massive open online course, or MOOC, on nanotechnology in Arabic. What's more interesting, though, he explained to me over, uh, uh, the other day over breakfast is some of the curious email he received from students registered uh, for his course. For example, and I saw these emails because we all read the emails. We had many emails to uh, read and many people to, um, to answer. Are you a real person? Are you really an Arab or are you an Israeli Jew speaking Arabic presenting to be an Arab? Um, and these kind of questions were raised throughout the, uh, at, at least at the beginning of the courses. Some of the students dropped, the students from the Arabic um, uh, na nations because, because it was the first uh, course in Arabic, it had a huge hype and a lot of people just speaking Arabic, I'm not so much interested in nanotechnology, but they saw, ah, now I can read what's written and I can understand what the professor is talking about, so let's enroll and see what's going on. But then those who did stay until the end, it was a huge success for us and for them. I'll show you some examples uh, towards the end. And also one of the students from Egypt even asked to be a TA, a teaching assistant, a virtual teaching assistant for the next courses. And then again, uh, at, the f at the beginning, we were saying, what is his uh, you know, hidden agenda? And, 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 and at, at a certain point, we saw that you know, he just liked the course, he enjoyed it, and he uh, wanted to help. So this is, um, I'm not sure that people who started the whole idea actually meant for this to happen, but this is something that um, um, we can use platforms such as these kind of platforms to really open ideas and um, share knowledge and share experience and collaborate with each other. So, um, okay, so um, this is some uh, video uh, shots, um, screenshots from the videos. Uh, um, one of the things coming from the education a discipline. Uh, we have to show nanotechnology in um, different perspectives, not only a verbal and textual and equations, but also using a lot of uh, simulations, animations, uh, pictures, and that was one of our uh, problems, all these simulations, and animations, and pictures, because Hussam took pictures from existing, um, you know, when, he, when we come to the classroom, we show we, t we take things from articles that we find interesting or from the internet, but here, because the course is open, it's not only for a small group of uh, people or students, we started to understand there is a whole IP, in, uh, intellectual property rights issues, uh, that we had to deal with. And um, uh, actually, Abil, uh, my student, had um, invested, I think, four months of her life just sitting down, writing all the list of um, um, the pictures and the simulations, and one by one asking um, uh, from the publishers, the uh, 
authorization or from the authors. And those who could, we could not get uh, authorization, Hussam just said, okay, I'm going to draw it in 4, 4 a.m. in the morning. I'll just draw it myself. And uh, this is how we worked. Very slow, and um, now I think there are better mechanisms, but um, this is something that it's important to say. Uh, so anyway, um, the these are the video lectures. Uh, we started at the beginning because it, has to f it had to follow. This was our idea or our principle. It had to follow the course that uh, Technion students are, uh, are uh, learning accordingly. And um, uh, the Technion Senate uh, was very afraid that we will uh, lower the expectations and lower the course level. So we had to show, no, this is one by one uh, a course that students at the Technion need to study. And uh, this is at the level of uh, Technion students. And people from all over the world, uh, if they want, they're welcome uh, to join us. And if not, it's, it's OK for us also. So, um, uh, so we followed um, not a 13 week, but a 10 week, but then we had two weeks of students working in project, and the Technion students had to present their project uh, in front of us. So that was the only uh, difference, actually, between the Technion students and people from um, other places in the world. Also, the Technion students, their grades were given by, the, by two TAs. And people from other places in the world, they, uh, we conducted peer grading. Um, so this is something from the education that it was very important for me, for students, not only to answer a final examination at the end of the course, like most of the engineering courses, but mostly um, working in small groups on innovative projects. So one of the things that I'm studying is innovative thinking. So this was um, my goal. How can we encourage students to be more innovative? What might work, might, what doesn't work um, as part of my uh, research? But um, the funny thing was that at a certain point, students said, well, we're thinking about all these innovative ideas. We are afraid that you're going to take these ideas, go into the laboratory, and just implement it. Where are our IPs, or intellectual property rights, or uh, 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 copyrights, etc.? And then we had to um, uh, involve uh, legal advisors, and they uh, issued a statement that all the ideas are the students, and um, it's theirs, nobody is going to steal their ideas. But it just goes to show you that really things were very innovative. And Hussam, at the end, when he read some of the, he, he couldn't read everything, but some of the um, projects that the students um, uh, developed, it was really interesting, <laughs> to say the least. So I, I'm going to show you some of the ideas. So this is the course. Um, students could see the course, uh, the whole course from week one to week 10, but they could enter the course lectures only when the uh, week started. Read uh, throughout the week. They had one week to read, watch, do uh, their assignments. And at the end, they had to answer a quiz of something like between eight to 10 multiple choice questions, some sort of a, a test yourself, but, and they could have done three times, and, and um, uh, their, but we did um, consider their, their grade uh, in these quizzes. So they had 10 quizzes, and they had also open-ended assignments, which I'll show you. So 30% was given for answering the quizzes, and student who did not, students who did not answer the quiz could not continue on working on the next uh, um, week. So I'm not sure now um, if it's OK or not, because you show the, I'll show you the completion rates. So maybe that was one of the things that um, uh, you know, people forgot. They didn't have time, and they, they couldn't uh, continue on. Uh, but it was important for us, for the Technion students. So this this was um, this was our consideration. And then they had two um, they had to answer two open ended questions in week three and week uh, seven, I think, which led them to think about the final project. Uh, these questions were individual questions. Uh, they answered individually, and in the final project, they had to meet with people virtually or physically and work together on a project. This is an example 
of a multiple choice question. And these are some examples of the open-ended questions. For example, if you could have an additional sense in addition to the five you have, what sense would you wish for? Which is, you know, very open. And we had very interesting ideas. And which kind of sensor would you like in your smartphone? So think openly, try to think of new ideas, read papers about senses maybe that animals have or plants, etc., and try to think what would you um, um, invent if you had um, a chance to. Open question check. Yes. So one of the questions is um, um, we had uh, thousands of people enrolled, at least at the beginning. And then, um, uh, and I, w I insisted on open-ended questions because you, the thesis is, and it's not my thesis, is that you cannot um, uh, encourage innovative thinking with closed-ended questions, or you can do that be very limited. I'm trying to be cautious. But anyway, um, these were open-ended questions, and um, who's going to mark them? So the idea was peer grading. Every person who submitted um, a, an assignment, one of these assignments or the final project, had to um, a read and evaluate according to a very rigid um, assessment uh, rubric we uh, gave them, a, at least three or more projects, assignments of other students. So this way, it was also educational because when you submit a paper, you have to read now papers of others, be very critical about it, um, why you think it's a good uh, work or not. You need to write um, a, a, your, a justify um, a, your answers. So this was part of the educational process, uh, but it was very difficult for the students and just some just said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to get my grade, so I don't care, I'm going to leave the course. And I'll show you statistics. But uh, those who stayed really produced high level um, in learning outcomes. More examples of questions, the image best describes, and they had to tick the correct answer. Another question, which of the following is not a type of carbon nanotube structure? And um, these were the types of questions. And um, of course, as the course became more complicated, the questions were more sophisticated, but mostly um, the level of knowledge, basic knowledge, just you know, um, check yourself if you understood the concepts, and maybe a little bit of understanding and implementation. These are the projects. 50% of the, cor the course grades uh, were uh, allocated for the project, and the project was design a nanosensor. When we say design is not going, it, it, we didn't mean go to the laboratory, but write a plan, a design. How would you design a nanosensor that imitates a specific sense um, for the good of humankind. And so, it's so it was so open, you can see in a few minutes there were so many interpretations throughout um, the different semesters. But um, the simple interpretation were nanosensors like these, which were not that innovative. They um, discussed the idea of nanosensors for hearing aids, you know, which are not that um, uh, something that will um, help us hear better, or maybe uh, uh, feel things better, etc. This nanosensor was uh, uh, developed uh, by, I think it's, it was Israeli students uh, with collaboration with um, I think maybe students from Turkey. And the idea is that uh, we have in our region, and actually all over the world, a lot of earthquakes. So what happens is that when we have earthquakes and people are are uh, under the, ru the rubbles, uh, we take dogs and dogs sniff from above. So why not uh, working with a sort of a robot, a cockroach robot with an uh, odor nanosensor that would crawl under the um, uh, piles of stones and uh, connect and uh, pinpoint the place where the people or the person is uh, trapped. And we have, uh, even at the Technion, we have different ideas. There is, um, in, in, mechanical, in mechanical engineering, they invented a snake, 
a robot snake that is a um, very similar idea, but these are their ideas and they have justified and they have presented uh, research on that uh, to show that it's not only a crazy idea, but it can actually be implemented. So these are some ideas of projects. This project I always show because it took, it took our ideas to the extreme. We, n we could have never thought a student could ever think about this type of nanosensor or uh, a combination of nanosensors. These students are, uh, are from China and um, young students, uh, 18, 19, I think, maybe 20. And their concern <laughs> is going into a, a pub and you know, finding some, someone who they like, but they're very shy, so they don't want to go to talk with him or her. So they thought about a love detector nanosensor, which you know, we were laughing, but it was very applicable. So it, it is based on hormones detectors and uh, pulse detectors and, and sweat detectors, et cetera, et cetera. And people are supposed to wear it um, whenever they go. All the people coming to the pub are, going, are supposed to wear it. And then if a person, I don't know, uh, is, uh, his pulse is very fast, uh, and maybe he likes this person, so a green light lights. But then the other person, if he doesn't like, or if she or he likes, the green uh, light also lights, but if not, a red light lights. So, yeah, so this was um, their idea, which was great. Another idea was uh, a person, f a group from India, um, about mosquitoes, um, and, you know, in India they have a lot of uh, mosquito problems, but also here, I think now we have it all over the world, and uh, a detector, um, a sensor, that, a patch that you put on your arms or ev somewhere in, the, um, in your body, and then it, um, it moves when a mosquito, uh, it senses a mosquito, and then it moves and you know that there is a mosquito somewhere and you can catch it when you see it. So it doesn't catch the mosquitoes or repel them, but you know that was their idea. And as you can see, everything was based on uh, previous studies, on articles, on um, in different types of the nanosensors. And it was, for us, it was a great joy uh, reading it and um, in, you know, being exposed to all these uh, interesting ideas. Okay, so um, we, uh, I, I showed you examples of projects and now let's see some statistics. Uh, who were our participants? So uh, for the English course, uh, the number of enroll enrollees, people who enrolled before the course started was 35,000. Once the, the course started, we, all, we only saw 11,000, around 11,000 people who actually uh, watched the videos. So we can say that we actually started only with 11,000 um, uh, participants. Uh, it seems that people just enroll to courses but don't even bother just, uh, to, to watch them. Uh, in the Arab course, in the Arabic course, uh, there were um, 6,000 enrollees, which uh, again, at the beginning of the course, they understood that it's in Arabic, but it's an Israeli university. And then there was a whole discussion in the forums, uh, as you, you heard, uh, who is this uh, lecturer, is he okay, is he pretending, et cetera, et cetera. And um, only 2,000 had actually started. Okay, so these are the beginning statistics. Uh, and uh, um, interesting enough is that the division in, in the, in between gender, for example, was very similar. Most of the participants were males, um, like many engineering courses, uh, which for me it's, it's uh, saddening, but uh, th these are the statistics. So uh, three quarters were men and only one quarter were women for the Arabic and the English. We hope that maybe with the Arabic courses, because women are not allowed sometimes in some countries to go to the universities without chaperone, etc., maybe more would uh, enroll online, but 
we could see that these are the same statistics. Um, very similar statistics distribution for vocation. Most of our uh, participants were students who wanted to um, a, a learn a more in depth or uh, widen what they have uh, studied in their universities. We also had people from the industry, uh, people who conduct research and are interested in innovations in uh, nanoscience, um, and uh, people who just wrote that they enrolled for the for you know as a hobby and. Um, and that's that. And uh, about ages, um, the age of 17 to the age of 70, somewhere here, and uh, 75 even. Uh, but most of them were the ages of uh, 18 to 25 or 26 to 35. Um, so these are usually the students who um, enroll students from other universities in, in the world, and these are people from the industry who are interested to see what's new. Okay, so how were they um, uh, distributed around the world? Uh, the top 10 uh, countries that participated, uh, so most of the participants were from the United States, then we had many from India, uh, United Kingdom, Spain, Brazil, Canada, Egypt, Greece, Taiwan, and China. So this is the English course, and it was interesting because we had people from Egypt who elected to take the course in English. And we had many other uh, in, uh, nationalities and countries, but um, there were, uh, the numbers were uh, less than uh, these numbers. Uh, uh, um, regarding the Arabic course, most of them, again, um, Arab-speaking people from the United States. So it's actually culturally related, people who are, um, are used to this kind of teaching and or learning um, online, have the the right equipment, they are connected uh, to the internet, uh, so um, these were the people who also enrolled to the Arabic course. Then we had people from Egypt, many people from Israel, Germany, Kuwait, Spain, United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Canada. And we even had people from Iraq, and that at that time, it was at the beginning, or I'm not sure in the beginning, but it was uh, a, in, during the war, which is still ongoing, but uh, it was amazing for us, people finding some sort of a haven from what is going on uh, around them and coming to participate in the course. So, as I said, I, we uh, examined the heterogeneity and we found that um, English course heterogeneity index was 0 0.92 and the Arabic courses, the Arabic was 0 0.74, which means that um, the Arabic uh, uh, participa participants were more a homogene a homogeneity in their uh, culture distribution. Um, because we know new people are coming from all over the world, we opened many forums for them to ask questions, uh, to present themselves, who are you, tell us a little bit more about yourself, and if you're seeking for partners for the project, um, uh, raise ideas and try to uh, collaborate with other people. So there was a forum, who are you, study groups, questions that relate specifically to the lectures, uh, assignments, general discussions, and also course feedback. The last one is um, the signature track. And not many participant, um, participants um, participate in this forum, but the idea is that people who, uh, this is an option that Coursera gives students who want a, a, a certificate that actually has a signature of Coursera that states that these students are actually the person that they say they are. So they had to go through um, a process of identification through a camera and use the same keyboards because Coursera had some uh, codes that um, could uh, identify the type, uh, the way people type, and um, that was the identification. And for that, people had to pay money. Otherwise, it's, it was all free. 
And this is an example of what a certificate people uh, receive. So it's actually the Academia of Coursera. You can see that uh, this is a signature, it's not the Technion giving, uh, issuing this uh, certificate. Uh, it's a statement of completion. Then John Doe is the name, of course, of the participant. And Hussam's signature is here. And this is the name of the course. And the Technion is written very small because the Technion, legal-wise, is not obliged to acknowledge this uh, certificate. And it was very important, not only for the Technion, but for all universities to say, people can take our courses. It's fine with us, but um, don't expect a year later to come to our university and trying to enroll uh, bases on uh, this certificate. Now there are some agreement of, and memorandum between universities and especially between co colleges and universities that allow students to uh, take these courses and sometimes they use Proctor Center, sometimes they don't. I'm going to show you some, uh, some statistics about um, uh, the study here. So this is a socio-cultural uh, study. And we try to compare between the English and the Arabic courses, uh, uh, regard focusing on engagement and learning outcomes. Then we looked at the motivation, the motivation, motivation gain, um, with relation to different modes of en engagement. And what we wanted to see is a focus on a, a MOOC completers and ask them what were their incentives. Because at that time, and this is an article that was already uh, published in 2016, at that time most of the research uh, focused on those who drop out. Why do you drop out? Why, what, could, what were your um, uh, disappointments, etc. So we focused on those who actually completed to understand what driven them to complete the course. Um, we used mixed methods uh, design and um, a, we um, distributed pre and post uh, questionnaires, knowledge questionnaires, and also a motivation based on the work of Glenn and Kobala. And these are science educators. Uh, so the, the motivation is motiva motivation towards a, a career. Um, in engineering and science and engineering and also motivation to study uh, engineering courses. And then also we analyze students' grades on their quizzes and uh, assignments, projects. So this is the theoretical background, the socio-cultural theory. I won't go into details, uh, uh, but the idea is that um, socio-cultural uh, researchers believe that um, learning is a process where you need to bring into account cultural aspects and uh, um, uh, encourage students to work in, um, in groups in order to um, assist one another and provide scaffolding to each other. So this is uh, the idea that um, is behind and the research. So once again, the research participants, we started uh, the statistics with the first week participants, the English and the Arabic. And these are the completers, as I said, around 3% and around 1% in the Arab courses. Uh, the research sample, uh, here we had all the people here were part of um, the 377 students who completed. Uh, we wanted everyone to participate in the, the uh, research, but of course they could have elected not to. And here we managed to um, um, ask, uh, or, or all those who completed in the Arabic course participated with us and even more that um, some others who decided not to complete. Um, so, so these are the statistics for um, engagement, what we call engagement, and um, on the right is um, the, Arab, uh, the Arabic course, and on the left is the English course, and um, you can see the blue lines are actually um, the number of uh, participants, and then um, actually viewing the videos. We had click data, so we could see how, what is the percent of people who are actually viewing the videos 
out of the 1100 of course that if we could con if we would consider the number of enrollees the 35000 then we would have a really small even smaller percentage a third of of that and um, and uh, the red um, lines are actually a those who answered either correct or wrong, but those who actually participated, answered, tried to answer the quizzes at the end of each week. And then we have the assignments. So the x-axis axis are the weeks. We have week one to week 10. And I don't know if you can see the green, yellow. These are the assignments they had to um, deliver. 39% actually viewed the videos, but only 12 decided to answer the quiz. 12% decided to um, answer the quiz at that week, and only 5% decided that they're going to submit and read the, uh, the papers of others because they did not receive grades unless they have submitted their review. So it just went, it dropped. And the interesting thing is that although the Arabic course started with um, a much less students, um, we see a similar pattern. Um, another interesting thing was uh, looking specifically at specific questions throughout the semester. So these are questions from the quiz. We have here the weeks. And um, the blue line now is the English MOOC participants and the red Arabic MOOC participants. And we see that the Arabic MOOC participants had to struggle more and their percentage were lower, a percentage of success in answering the questions, but not statistically significant. The only um, a, a difference or the main difference was here. And we try to figure out what happened there in this question. And um, there was a problem in translation. So it wasn't fair for the Arabic. When we asked Nisreen, she said, well, it's not very clear. So maybe that was the problem. And then we actually uh, changed it. Um, once Hussam decided that this is what he's going to do every year, this is how students at the Technion are, te are studying. We don't have a comparison a course unless we go back to years before that, take the data from students and see their final grades because the, the course was taught totally different and we haven't done that. Uh, another uh, thing that we looked in uh, looked at was the um, uh, correlation and okay so so it was the assignments the open assignments and they had um, at this point three open assignments and one project uh, and once again the um, here we did find uh, significant differences and as you can see, the English students received really high grades compared to the, uh, the students from the Arabic course. Um, this drop was uh, due to um, lost in connection, we call it. The idea was that people from, um, this, is, this is our hypothesis. We, we couldn't, um, we did ask some students feedback, but we didn't do it statistically. But people who, who enrolled to the Arabic course are used to a very traditional way of teaching, especially engineering. So they are used to lectures, exercises, closed-ended exercises, and maybe laboratory work. Here we asked them to think about innovative ideas. It was very open for them. They were, um, they, they felt like they're um, losing connection with the course because they said, well, teach us. You know, we come to learn, teach us. And we said, no, you need to be open-minded, think about things. So there was something that we didn't communicate maybe, or they didn't receive what the idea of the course uh, was. Um, these are examples of questions from the post-test and, uh, again, the means and standard deviations, uh, questions such as what is the dimensionality of nanowires or when discussing nanoscience, what is the size range of structures? Questions that are not that difficult, but you can see these are adjusted means. So these are actually 
taking the post test and deducting from the pre statistically to see to having every student coming on the same level and you can see that the grades are really low um, so yeah the, the questions were difficult for them um, even though if there are experts in nanotechnology maybe these questions seem very simple and basic um, this, um, these are some statistics regarding the motivation, students' motivation. So we used Glenn and Kobala's uh, instrument, uh, which refers to motivation for careers in uh, engineering and sciences, and they divide their items uh, into four main categories, intrinsic motivation, self-determination, I'm determined to finish, complete this course, whatever, even if it's difficult for me, self-efficacy, I have the ability, I'm, you know, I have the ability to complete, and career motivation, I need to complete it because it's good for my career. And um, we saw some uh, statistical, um, um, we compared between completers and non-completers, of course, the uh, completers motivation was much higher um, and uh, we saw some differences not for every category but especially for self-determination those who actually completed even if they're they didn't know the whole you know they weren't and I'll show you at the end someone who didn't come from nanotechnology at all she was um, she had a BSc I think in English language but she was interested and she was very determined to finish the course and, and also self-assurance or self-efficacy, I'm sure that I am good enough and I'll be able to, uh, so they, even if they didn't um, receive high grades in the quizzes or the assignments, they continued on delivering and um, answering the questions. Um, this is another, uh, I think, an interesting graph we found. Uh, what what uh, interested me is uh, how does the forum uh, helps people or what is the connection between participating in forums, all these long list of forums, uh, and their motivation. Um, and this is the motivation gain. The, it means that the delta between the pre and the post, it means that people who finished the course were highly motivated as this um, number raises. And it wasn't a linear, as you can see, a graph. Uh, it, uh, it has a U shape. And we found that uh, most of the people post um, uh, to the forums questions, uh, one or two, this is the number of questions or the number of posts, sorry. Some of the posts were answers to other people, some uh, remarks, some complaints, some questions, etc. So these are the number of posts they have uh, added to the different forums. And most of the people uh, write five, six in average, posts something like this and then the more they write they gain more confidence maybe more motivation to continue on have support from others but it doesn't go linear so there is this area where people posted 20 30 even sometimes I don't know yeah we had around 40 posts and then not only the, their motivation doesn't grow it stays the same or even drops down. And I think that we can all think about, um, and some, some of them didn't even complete. We were sure that those who are very engaged uh, or over-engaged, we call it over-engagement. So if I'm too engaged and I am always answering and, quest and question, asking questions, and, then um, the motivation drops. And one of the reasons is that maybe these uh, these participants and uh, asked a lot of questions but didn't receive answers so their motivation dropped and some of the posts were complaints the, this was not clear that was not clear so um, they just voiced their complaints and then just de decided to drop out so these were some of the reasons and uh, it was interesting to see so when, when characterizing the MOOC uh, uh, completers, we saw, uh, we identified uh, five characteristics. Uh, those who had problems, usually people from the industry or research centers who had a specific problem and hoped to 
find solution either from uh, listening to uh, the videos or even asking Hussam Hayek. They sent him emails. Uh, he received, I think, thousands of emails. I don't know how he did that, but he was very patient and usually he answered. Also, the TAs were working very hard to answer questions. Um, so I have some examples of that. Um, as I said earlier, there, was, uh, there, are, there were people who just wanted the forums to network with people, suggest ideas, and think about maybe even new markets to uh, present their ideas or form some uh, um, group work or, I don't know, startups, uh, international startups. Benefactors, those who wanted to uh, find a solution to their society, not to their own company, but uh, like the earthquake idea, uh, innova innovation seekers, those who wanted to, to learn what is new in the world with uh, nanosensors, and students, usually academic students, who wanted uh, to learn, widen their scope of learning, to learn new things. Uh, this is an example of a uh, uh, email that um, Hussam received from a researcher from India, and he is, um, I'll just write, thank you very much for your wonderful course. I'm uh, really happy to have taken your course and got a lot uh, of uh, latest information. I'm uh, currently working in the area of ocular cancer, and then from then on, he just talks about his problem, asking Hussam to solve his problem. So this is uh, one of the things. I think Hussam gave him some good tips. I, I'm not sure. Um, this was a very interesting, um, I, um, yeah, I, I left the name. I in some lectures, I just delete the name because he's a professor in uh, Baghdad University, and he, there was even a picture of him, and uh, he was sitting with his group of students watching week after week Hussam's um, e e lectures and communicating with us and he, the war was around them and he said that that was their con communication uh, to the world to learn what is new because they had little uh, way, other ways to learn <coughs> about innovations in this field. Um, and examples of the benefic benefactors, those who wrote projects that were um, for the good of uh, mankind. Uh, and this is very interesting because um, this is a, um, a picture of the uh, first page that this group actually um, sent us. So the project was that not that innovative. It's uh, the Synthetic Eye Project, which is okay, but not that exciting. Um, you know, um, innovative-wise, but what was very exciting was to read what they have written on uh, the first page. The only thing more powerful than a big idea is the team that can see it through. And the team was, um, a, the, the team was a com a composed from a person from Denmark who had BSc in biochemistry, a person from India, MSc in nanoscience and technology, uh, uh, um, a person from Costa Rica, this is the one with BA in English language, she finished the course, and from Saudi Arabia. So for us, it was very exciting also to see these um, projects. Uh, some conclusions. So, um, you know, nanotechnology or the idea of nanosensors, we saw that it attracts people, not only scientists and engineers, but really people from all over the world with, with just interest in, in this field, wanting to learn more about it. The lack of online proficiency, we found it with the Arab group. Some of the reasons that the Arab participants didn't succeed very well is that they have bad internet connections, or uh, so, so it was technically difficult for them. Uh, so it had negative influence on their, on their learning outcomes, and especially it was difficult for them to um, work on <laughs> ill-structured problems, open problems. It was really difficult for them. It was new for them. Maybe now the same people had, now if I ask them to do uh, new assignments, maybe they would change their perspective. And learning about new nano devices, career motivation, and contributing to the common good were ongoing motives uh, that encourage students to complete the course. Uh, and 
the final sentence, in an era of global changes, our study provides some insights about the challenges, mostly challenges, uh, of next generation educators in higher education. Yeah, so moving from individual to small group to forming a community. So thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.